All right, two things. Number one, yes, I have contracted some kind of face disease, and I think it's the kind that can go through the internet tube, so you may want to watch this one at a little greater distance than you normally do. Thing number two, one time my wife and I decided it would be a good idea to get into our Saturn SL1 and do a giant road trip all the way down the Baja Peninsula in Mexico, and for the most part, it was magical. But there was this one time where she was driving and we saw this little town out in the distance and, you know, one road in, one road out kind of deal. And we're like, yeah, let's go check that thing out. And so we're driving down the one road and then there's a police blockade and multiple officers and they all have the, uh, the guns. They come walking up to the car and they're like, hey, we're doing a, a fund drive for a special police donation fund. Would you like to make a donation to the local police? And I was like... Yes, we would. And so I kind of reached for some money. And before I could hand the nice armed gentleman my money, my wife said, no, thank you. No, we're on kind of a tight budget on this trip, but good luck with your fun drive. And then she just drove away. And as she did so, I kind of made eye contact with one of the cops for a second. I was like, I don't, I don't know what's happening, sir. And so we just drove in and we got some fish tacos. And in that moment, simultaneously, I was horrified at my wife's decision making and also wildly attracted to her. I'm still not sure quite what to make of that. Whatever the case, I explained to her somewhere along the way as we quickly fled that town that from here on out, we're, we're probably going to pay those fees because even though they seem optional, they're really probably not very optional in places where there's no accountability and no one to come to help in the most remote rural parts of the world. And those men had guns and also they had guns. She agreed that we could pay bribes in the future. Here's the deal, though. When we look at Matthew chapter 17, why am I in Luke 12? Like, do I even do this? Have I even made any videos on the internet? What am I doing here? There we go. When we're in Matthew chapter 17, we come to this moment where Jesus is questioned, or rather Peter is questioned for Jesus, about whether or not he pays the temple tax. Now, to you and me as outsiders, we hear about some temple tax in the Bible, and it sounds like an optional religious donation thing, where like you kick in if you feel like it, but it was not optional. This was the kind of thing that you had to do if you were a part of this society. And so one of the things that this passage is feeling out is how Jewish is Jesus? Is he still connected to all this stuff that he's come from or is he blown it up and making something entirely new? So in this little tiny passage in Matthew 17 verses 24 through whatever, the end of the chapter that we're going to look at here in this video, we are dealing with something that is simultaneously a very small question of is Jesus going to pay this temple tax? And what is the temple tax? But also a much larger, super hyper important theological question that has implications for understanding the entirety of the Bible and where you and I fit if we choose to be a part of this whole Christianity thing. So pause the video if you want to. And really, I mean, you should want to. It'll be way better if you do. And read Matthew 17 verses 24 through the end of the chapter. And then we're going to talk about this thing. I'm Matt, it's 10 Minute Bible Hour. Here we go. Sorry about the disease. <laughs> Now, right now, some of you watch this channel a lot might be thinking, hey, weren't we doing something on Luke? Don't we need to go make more Luke videos? Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll probably get to that here in a little bit. But I just want to talk about this passage in Matthew because I was looking at it and it's interesting. Disclaimer over. Here's the deal. In order to understand anything that's going on in Matthew, we have to understand a few things about the book of Matthew in general. First of all, this is written by a Jewish guy who gives an account of his own conversion here in chapter 9. He was a stooge for the Roman government. He was a tax collector, so a sellout to his own people, somebody who was exploiting the opportunity of being an occupied nation by siding with the occupiers to enrich himself. So nobody really liked him. Then Jesus comes along and he has this amazing transformation and he goes on to write this incredibly important transitional account of the life and work of Jesus that really bridges the gap between all of the old stuff here and all of the new stuff here. So Matthew is a book that is written to a Jewish audience. It's written to people who would have been absolutely steeped in all of the history and prophecy and law of the Jewish people. So one of the things that's both exciting and tricky about looking at anything in Matthew is that we can go as far down this rabbit hole as we want because there's so much depth to explore in terms of cultural and historical background, but also it can be kind of challenging because sometimes the meaning of the text isn't immediately obvious on the surface. Or maybe I should say sometimes the full implications of the text aren't immediately obvious on the surface. Well, here's the deal. In the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, you've got this thing where God makes the world and then stuff goes sideways and it looks like everything's going to fall apart and be ruined forever. But God 
immediately begins this redemptive process. And he does so by working with different people in really unique ways to build toward what is this predicted culminating event where everything is going to get redeemed and fixed. So, for example, early in the book of Genesis, God picks this guy, Abram, out of the clear blue sky and makes a deal with him. It's like, hey, no matter what you do or good stuff, stupid stuff, whatever, I'm going to make you a great nation and all of the nations will be blessed through this great nation. Oh, okay, cool. So we've established that God is creating a people unto himself. Then, uh, I don't know what it comes to, probably about 600 years later, maybe even a little bit more, God makes another deal with Moses on the back end of that whole Exodus cross the Red Sea thing. And this deal is a very conditional one. He says, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And if you do stupid stuff and disobey me, I'm going to punish you. If you obey me, I'm going to bless you. But either way, all the nations are going to know that I'm the real God and that you are my people. Uh, Fast forward about another 400 years and you've got the second king of Israel, a guy named David. And God makes a promise to David. It's unconditional once again. He says to David, whatever you do, whether you're an idiot or not, and sometimes he was an idiot, I am going to make this great kingdom and this great line of kings that will come out of your line. And the great king for all of eternity will sit on the throne of this eternal kingdom. And through this great king, all this redemption is going to happen. Now I'm dragging into that a whole bunch of later prophecy and other stuff from the Old Testament, but that's the gist. Then the Old Testament goes on to describe the collapse of the northern and southern kingdoms of the the Hebrew people. And ultimately, it ends on something that looks rather hopeless politically, but there's all this language about there still being hope and this promise of the, this Messiah who is supposed to come. Now, I know that's a lot of background, but here's where it pays off. We get into the book of Matthew. The thing opens with this enormous pedigree statement, a genealogy of Jesus that connects a whole lot of the dots between what happened in the old part and Jesus himself. And so even in the first chapter, it looks like, wait a minute, are you suggesting this guy is the king who was promised? That this is the Messiah? That's a very bold claim. People got into a lot of trouble for getting that claim wrong at times. So it's a big deal. But then we go through all of this stuff that Jesus said and did, and it seems like it's the fulfillment of all these things that happened in the past. Then Jesus gets up, he gives a sermon on the mountain, chapters five through seven, and it looks like Jesus really is claiming to have the authority to initiate this kingdom of God that was promised in the Old Testament. Well, then Jesus demonstrates all kinds of authority over nature in chapters 8 and 9, and then he runs into all kinds of opposition as we get into chapters 12 and 13, or rather in 13, he gives a whole bunch of parables that describe what his kingdom is going to be like a little bit more and how that's going to unfold through history. And then as we get toward chapters 15, 16, and 17, Jesus honeymoon period up north with people who seemed to largely like what he was doing. It's kind of coming to an end. And Jesus is explaining to his disciples that he's going to have to go to Jerusalem and die soon. And so the disciples are trying to understand how this whole thing is going to work out and where they ultimately fit in relationship to Jesus. And Matthew chapter 17 opens with the transfiguration, with Jesus being shown in his glory to three of the disciples and God affirming him. But also then they come back down the mountain. There's a reminder, yeah, also I'm going to die soon. So these guys' heads are spinning. And we come back from this road trip that takes us away from where Jesus has done most of his business in Capernaum. And we make our way back to Capernaum, the hometown of Jesus, his base of operations for almost everything that he's done so far in his ministry. And the most transcendent, important stuff ever has happened. Like the laws of time and space have just been broken before Peter's very eyes. He has had his eyes open to the reality that if Jesus is who he thinks Jesus is, and if Jesus is who Jesus is saying he is, everything about the world is about to change. And somehow Peter is going to be near the epicenter of all of this comes back to Capernaum, and he gets met with one of the most mundane questions ever. Yeah, uh, about your taxes? Seriously, that's what it is. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax, that's the temple tax I referenced earlier, came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? And Peter's like, yeah. And that's the end of that conversation. Now, again, on the one hand, part of the power of the way Matthew has phrased this is the contrast between the stuff we just saw and the impotence of what this looks like. But there's something bigger going on here. So Peter comes back into the house and Jesus is the first to speak as he does so. 
He says, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? Ah, it's kind of cryptic. But before we even get into what Jesus actually asked him, it's interesting in comparison with the rest of the book of Matthew to notice that Jesus introduced the question. A lot of times it's the disciples who didn't understand a parable or don't really get why Jesus said or did something he did. And then when they get in private, they're like, hey, what was the, what was the plan with that? I mean, we acted like we knew what you were doing, but we had no idea what you were doing. Here, Jesus has something he wants to teach. So for anybody who's interested in what Jesus is into, this is a place to you know, perk up your ears and pay attention because there's some theology coming. So oh, he asked this question, who do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes from, from their own sons or from others? So we don't really do kings anymore, at least not like this. But uh, come on, you've seen enough movies and stuff. Eh? You kind of get the gist here. You got a king, and then normally the person who succeeds a king is the king's kid. And there's like a special position of honor for all of the king's family and so forth, that, that noble leadership family. And so in a sense, a prince is in line to become the head of the household and the king of a realm, which means that that prince, in a way, already kind of owns everything. And so I suppose the answer would be the one that Peter gives from others. Peter answered, well, yeah. I mean, why would you collect a tax from your own kid? That's like taking a hundred bucks out of one drawer in your house and putting a hundred bucks in another drawer in your house. It just doesn't matter. Uh, Then the sons are exempt, Jesus answered him. Okay, so it seems like we're all on the same page here. But so that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Wait, huh? All right. Okay, two things here. Let's start with the simple one. So Jesus is going to pay this tax. Uh, It's in the Bible. Seems like right now it's a thing that he feels obligated to do. So we're reminded that Jesus is very Jewish and that he is not breaking any of the the religious laws or the civil laws. He's honored these things. But it seems like there's more going on here. And I think if we look close, we can wrap our brains around it. Remember that language that we used a little bit earlier about how God was making a people for himself with the call of Abram, later called Abraham. And that God's chosen people in the Old Testament are kind of the, know, guinea pig's too harsh a word, but they're, they are the test case that God uses to act out all of the stuff that he wants to communicate about himself to the larger world. But then we get to the New Testament, and there's all this language in here about Jesus carving out a new family for himself, not ditching the old family or abolishing the old family, but making a new, broader people for himself. And the intonation, no, it's not even an intonation, the overt language that maybe starts subtle and gets really bold as the New Testament goes along, is that Jesus is making a new family that is based on faith and not ethnicity. And that the people who are in this family are sons and daughters of the king that in some way they share in the inheritance of the Son of God. And it's it's a pretty bold promises. And that all of these ideas about redemption and hope that we see in the Old Testament and the words of Jesus are kind of wrapped up in this new position that people have, that, that people are a new creation in Christ and that they take on this position of, um, of honor in the family of God. And that this has nothing to do with what you look like or your gender or what you're into or where you're from or what language you speak or anything. It has to do with one thing and one thing only. And that is your relationship to the King, your relationship to Christ. And so if you are in a relationship with the King and a right relationship with the King means you acknowledge him as King, then I guess you're in this new family of faith. Awesome. So wait a minute though. Okay, Jesus seems to be saying then that it wouldn't make a ton of sense for him to have to pay the temple tax because, well, it's his house. It's why he felt permission to go and flip over tables and bust things up a little bit further on down the road here. It's his father's house. He belongs there. He has ownership of it. So there's that element. But also the intonation here is that everyone who is in this new family of faith also has some sort of stake in this house or this family of God. And as a result, maybe that calls into question how this temple tax is going to work. Well, why are we paying the temple tax anyway? Eh, put a couple of verses up over here that you can go and look up if you want to, to see what exactly the language was in the Old Testament. But the bottom line is the temple is the place where God lived. 
he showed up there. He lived in the Holy of Holies, whether it was the tabernacle, which was like the temporary early temple, or the like official brick and mortar temple that was built by Solomon. And eventually they got wrecked and that was rebuilt by Herod and was kind of brand spanking new at this point in history. And God lives in there, right? Yeah, I mean, you got to take that seriously. And, and God dwells among the Hebrew people. And the town in which he dwells is kind of a big deal. But what does the Bible say about how that works now that we're in Christ? I mean, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit shows up. In Acts chapter 2, we see that the Holy Spirit is going to indwell believers. And that becomes very clear as we go through the rest of the book of Acts. So what now then is the temple of God, is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Is it a building of brick and mortar where God lives in that one place amongst his people? Or does God live inside each member of this new family of faith? Well, I think it's the latter, which means that what we're seeing here is a really sneaky transitional passage between the old way of doing things and what Jesus is inaugurating with this new kingdom. What we're seeing is a really sneaky, interesting um, manifestation of what Jesus is saying in Matthew 5, 17. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So does the value of there being a temple go away because Jesus has created a new family of faith and God lives in each of those believers and those members of that family of faith? Well, no, the principle of the temple still absolutely applies. It's just complete. Instead of going to a place where we can encounter or be in vague proximity to God, we have absolutely uninterrupted proximity to God through the work of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection and in inaugurating this kingdom. Now, look, if this language is getting a little bit overwhelming, I understand it can get kind of uh, theology-y when we get into all of this deep water Matthew stuff, but let me put it a different way. When I was a kid, some of my friend's parents went in on buying this building and they made a place called um, Roll America. It was the first roller skating rink I had ever been to, and they had the records and stuff, and they put them on. And then, for those of you who are younger, what this was, it was a, an activity where your ancestors would strap wheels to their feet and then skate in circles to popular music and flirt with people of the opposite sex. It was absolutely magical. But these places also had arcades with pinball machines and primitive early video games. And they were a quarter a piece, which was a lot of money to me back then. But there is the craziest thing ever that I had never thought of and that melted my brain that they did at this roller skating rink. My friend's parents would take a big stack of quarters and they'd paint them all green. Then they'd give them to their kids and the kids could play the video games with the green quarters then guess what happened when they cleaned out the coin box on the video game machines? They would just pick out the green quarters and give them back to the kids. The idea being, hey kids, you get the green quarter because you're part owners of your parents' roller skating establishment. So this is something that in a way you already own and it doesn't make sense for you to pay for something that we have in infinite abundance and that is not consumable and that we can provide for you again and again and again. Likewise, in this situation, Jesus chose to pay that tax because all the work here wasn't done yet and we were still in the process of fulfillment. But the principle of Jesus' language is, uh, yeah, here's the miraculous sign. Like just, they catch a fish. There'll be some coins in there, four drachma coins, probably a Tyrian shekel is what it's actually called is the precise coin. It'll be in there. You just pay the temple tax to keep everybody cool. But long term, the evidence here suggests that this is a moment that is inching toward fulfillment that you and me and Peter and anybody else in this family of faith effectively has that green quarter and we share in the eternal spiritual riches and completion of this promised kingdom over which Christ is the head. Was that a lot? Because I feel like that was a lot, but I think it's really, really fun. I'm going to dabble from time to time in some of these Matthew passages as I'm poking around in this book, but we'll get back to some other content as well as we get a little further down the road. On the way out the door... I need to say thank you again for the people who support this program on Patreon, patreon.com slash TMBH. So thank you to everybody who supports in little ways, everybody who supports in big ways. And thank you to the rest of you who are like, I'm not supporting things on the internet. That's dumb. I respect your opinion. I disagree. I respect your opinion. And I'm just really gr grateful that you will show up here, take this kind of time with me to jump deeply into content like this and think about stuff that whether we agree or disagree about it is really important to game out. Cool. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.